Good morning, Lakeview. This is Mr. Cabe from Princeton Elementary coming to you again with another story that I'd like to share with you. When I was in the library the other day, I found a whole stack of books about one of my favorite places, Michigan. And so for the next few days, I'll be reading you stories from Michigan about Michigan and about different places. And today, the very first book that was on that stack was one of my favorites. And it tells a story about a Michigan legend. And that book is called The Edmund Fitzgerald, The Song of the Bell. This story is by Kathy Jo Wargen and was illustrated by a world famous artist called Gilbert Van Frankenhusen. And before I read this book, I would like to dedicate this book to my friend, Mr. Puma at Ardmore, because in all the years that I taught at Ardmore with Mr. Puma, I know the Edmund Fitzgerald was one of his favorite stories. And I just wanted to dedicate my reading today to Mr. Puma, and I hope you're doing well, my friend. All right, well, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the back of the book says, the bell rings forever where heroes are found, where the soul of the sailor is heard, held in its sound. We tell them goodbye with a loving farewell, but their legend lives on in the song of the bell. Hmm. The Edmund Fitzgerald. Leaving port from Superior, Wisconsin, on a sunny November day, the crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald is looking forward to a routine crossing of Deep Lake Superior. Heading for Zug Island in Detroit, Michigan, the giant transport ship is loaded with ore that will be used to build cars. But disaster is building in the wind as a storm begins to track after the great ship. Author Kathy Jo Wargen's suspenseful retelling of the last hours of the doomed vessel pays homage to all the sailors who traverse deep waters in fair skies and foul. Paintings from award-winning artist Gilbert Van Frankenhusen bring the story to life, engaging all readers, young and old. Hmm. Very interesting. And the story opens up with a short passage that describes what the Great Lakes are a little bit to kind of set the story before we begin. Long, long ago, deep glaciers lay cold and hard upon the land. Over time, these glaciers these huge walls of ice began to thaw and move. Moving away, scraping deep basins into the earth. As they pushed along each large depression filled with water from the melting ice, giving birth to a large and powerful body of fresh water we now call the Great Lakes. Maybe you didn't know that the Great Lakes were shaped by icebergs melting years ago, many, many years ago. Not icebergs, glaciers. <clears throat> and now the story begins. It was a warm Sunday afternoon on November 9th, 1975. This was a time when people wore bell-bottom pants and platform shoes and were learning a dance called the hustle. Gerald R. Ford was president of the United States. A loaf of bread cost about 38 cents and the waterways of Great Lakes were filled with boats carrying coal, salt, lumber, and iron ore. On this day, a group of sailors left port out of Duluth Superior Harbor in Superior, Wisconsin. That morning, the Edmund Fitzgerald had been loaded with 26,000 tons of taconite pellets, which are tiny balls made from refined iron ore. This ore was to be taken to Zug Island in the Detroit River and used to build cars. This was the job of men aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald to safely transport 
the taconite from the Iron Range of Minnesota to the ports across the Great Lakes. And then here comes that saying again. The bell rings forever where heroes are found, for the soul of the sailor is held in its sound. The pictures are have beautiful colors. And in the background, you can see the Edmund Fitzgerald. At 729 feet long, the Edmund Fitzgerald was the largest ship on the Great Lakes from the time it was launched in 1958 until larger ships came along in 1971. Though all its days, it was called the pride of the American flag and was the finest cargo ship on the Great Lakes. Because of this, only the best sailors in the fleet were offered the chance to work on board. The ship plowed its way northeast in a slow, steady way. Captain Gerald Ernest McSorley knew that bad weather was blowing in because the Weather Bureau had issued a gale warning earlier that day. It was now early evening, and he knew to pay close attention to the weather as they made their journey. Lake Superior is the deepest and largest of all the Great Lakes and its vast size could be troublesome when storms blow in. But at the moment, this did not seem to bother Captain McSorley or his crew. They had experience with the wild storms of Lake Superior and they knew their jobs well. So as the ship pushed on, the men kept busy with their duties. John Simmons, the wheelsman, steered the ship while Nolan Church, the porter, helped serve meals in the ship's gallery. John McCarthy, a first mate, assisted the captain while the cook polished a huge bell that sat on top of the pilot house. Every job on the ship was important, but it was usually a tradition for the cook to take care of the 200 pound bronze bell. The bell was buffed and shined to a beautiful golden luster, as if it were a brilliant crown. The bell rang every four hours to announce a change in the watch. Other times it rang, it rang to warn of fog. And when it did, it always rang with a rich and lovely sound, reaching deep into the souls of the crewmen on board. And here comes that saying again from the beginning of the story. The soul of each sailor sang out in the chime of a beautiful bell as it rang to keep time. Those little passages are reminding us about how special the bell is each time. And that it's significant, it means important. By nightfall, the Edmund Fitzgerald had traveled many miles. Captain McSorley knew that another ship carrying Taconite, the Arthur M. Anderson, was traveling behind him. It had left port out of Two Harbors, Minnesota, and was heading to Gary, Indiana. The two ships pushed through, pushed on through midnight and into the early hours of morning. As they did, the waves grew around them. You see the waves are getting much bigger. Black water whipped into the mass of confusion, striking out at the ship. The fresh water sea roared, and it was nearly impossible to tell the rain and snow from the tops of the waves.
But even as the storm raged around them, the 29 men aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald continued with their jobs, watchful and alert. And all the while, the bell remained steadfast as the wind blew all around it. Another one of those sayings for us to think about. The men changed watch with the sound of the bell. It rang through the storm as the freezing rain fell. At nearly two in the morning, a voice came in over the Edmund Fitzgerald's radio. It was Jesse Bernie Cooper, captain of the Arthur M. Anderson. He radioed Captain McSorley to talk about the bad weather. They were traveling close together in the shelter of Highlands on the northerly route along the Canadian shore, rather than going straight across Lake Superior. Although this route was longer, it would be safer. So the pair pushed on, not knowing what would happen next. The battered bell rang as the storm held its grip. It rang for the men as the heart of the ship. You see the two ships were both traveling close to each other and keeping in touch so that they could warn each other and help each other if they needed to. By early afternoon the next day, the Edmund Fitzgerald was far past Isle Royal and the Keweenaw Peninsula when something began to worry Captain McSorley. His long range radar was not working and he needed it to pass safely by, Mishipico by Mishpicotan Island and the Caribou Island. These are dangerous areas to pass and Captain McSorley knew he should not get in too close to Caribou Island because of six fathom shoal, which is a hard, rocky, shallow area that might tear the ship's hull into pieces. The other ship, the Arthur M. Anderson, was about 16 miles behind the Edmund Fitzgerald. Captain Cooper of the Anderson watched his radar, noticing the path the Fitzgerald was taking as it rounded past Caribou Island. Captain Cooper turned to his first mate, Morgan Clark. Look at this, Morgan. The Fitzgerald is a lot closer to Six Fathom Shoal than I would like my ship to be. Hmm. Wonder what'll happen next. Minutes later, Captain McSorley of the Fitzgerald radioed the Anderson and spoke to First Mate Clark. Anderson, this is a Fitzgerald. I have sustained some topside damage. I have a fence rail laid down, two vents lost or damaged, and a starboard list. I'm checking down. Will you stay by me until I get to Whitefish? Hmm. Captain Cooper replied, Roger that, Fitzgerald. Do you have your pumps going? Yes, replied Captain Sorley, both of them. As the ship moved on with a terrible list, the bell still rang through the snow and the mist. First mate, Cooper, was worried. A list meant the Fitzgerald was taking on water and leaning to one side. Damaged vents could mean water might pour into the ballast tanks, which were deep tanks on either side of the ship's cargo hold. These tanks can be filled with water when the ship is traveling light to make the boat level and the journey safe. But the Fitzgerald was full of cargo. If it took on water, the weight could make the ship so heavy that it would sit dangerously low in the water. <clears throat> Hmm. Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. I have lost both radars. Can you provide me with radar plots till we reach Whitefish Bay? 
Roger that, Fitzgerald, said the Anderson. We'll keep you advised of position. So now the Fitzgerald, they have lost their, their map, and they're not sure exactly where they're at. So <clears throat> the radar is working on the Anderson ship. And so the captain asked the Anderson, can you see me on your radar? Which they can. And he said, would you please tell me where we're at? Because I'm not sure. And let us know. And of course, the Anderson said yes. The story continues. The storm was heavy. The storm was heavying water upon the ship. And now both long and short radar were gone. Captain McSorley knew that the Edmund Fitzgerald had to make the sheltered lee of Whitefish Point. Getting there was his only hope, and the only hope for the other men as well. But as the Edmund Fitzgerald and the Arthur Anderson struggled east, the wind roared and the waves grew even larger. With no radar, Captain McSorley used his radio direction finder to track a beacon signal from Whitefish Point, which assured him he was going in the right direction. The exhausted crew struggled to maintain the ship in the storm, trying to make it to Whitefish Bay. Captain McSorley was tracking his course when suddenly the radio direction beacon from Whitefish Point disappeared. The storm had taken out the power to Whitefish Point. With no guiding radar or radio beacon, the Fitzgerald was blind in the storm. It was dark and cold and the Edmund Fitzgerald had to fight its way through the night. No one was allowed on deck and the men held onto the hope that the Fitzgerald would make it to Whitefish Bay, only 20 miles ahead. At 10 minutes past seven o'clock that night, first mate Clark of the Anderson noticed a ship heading in the direction of the Fitzgerald. Because the Anderson was now acting as the eyes of the Fitzgerald, he radioed Captain McSorley to tell him that the ship would pass by safely. After that, the first mate asked, Fitzgerald, there is, this is the Anderson. Have you checked down? Yes, we have, replied Captain McSorley. By the way, Fitzgerald, how are you making out with your problem? Captain McSorley replied, we are holding our own. Their friends on the Anderson were very nervous because they knew that the Fitzgerald was in that bad storm without any radar. <clears throat> the first mate of the Anderson was watching the Fitzgerald's progress on his radar when all of a sudden the ship simply vanished from the screen. Captain Cooper ordered his men to search the horizon for the Edmund Fitzgerald, but the men saw nothing. The great ship could not be seen. There is the blowing snow and the pounding waves. The Edmund Fitzgerald and the 29 men aboard it disappeared without a cry for help. There isn't a sound except for the bell. Some say it rang out when the mighty ship fell. The Edmund Fitzgerald was found later, lying broken and twisted on the bottom of Lake Superior, only 17 miles from the shelter of Whitefish Point. The great ship had plunged to the bottom so fast no one may ever be sure what caused it to sink. Epilogue. On July 4th, 1995, 20 years after the tragic loss of the Edmund Fitzgerald, special divers went to the wreck to recover the bell from the ship. When the divers cut the bell free, it was hoisted to the surface. Along the way, as it swung on the cable, 
the bell chimed again for the sailors, ringing out beautifully as it broke the surface and came into the sunlight for the first time in so many years. A replica bell inscribed with the names of the 29 men who died that night was brought down to the ship where it will remain forever as a tribute to those lost. Then as a wreath of flowers was tossed upon the water, the family members said goodbye to the men they loved so much. The bell rings forever where heroes are found for the souls of the sailor is held in its sound. We tell them goodbye with a loving farewell, but their legend lives on in the song of the bell. I hope you enjoyed the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and I hope that you're enjoying the time with your family and being safe. Don't forget to read and check out some other books about Michigan. I'll be back in the next couple days with another one too. But until then, and again, to my friend, Mr. Puma, take care, be safe, and I'll see you in Lakeview.